सेंट्रल बिल्डिंग रिसर्च इंस्टीट्यूट रुड़की The Earth, a habitat of intelligent beings, bestowed with mesmerizing beauty. But this is only one face of the pits floating on molten lava. The collision of these plates gave birth to the great Himalayas. The collision that started some 50 million years ago is not yet over. The Himalayas are still folding, still rising and still cracking. This process emits tremendous amount of energy that can shake a large part of our country. The shaking is powerful enough to destroy any man-made structure built upon it. The divine beauty of nature often leaves us spellbound and we forget that more than 50% of our country is vulnerable to major earthquakes. In the next 50 years, about 200 million people of India are likely to suffer strong ground movements. About 80% of all the buildings we have today are unsafe in earthquakes. In spite of this, we still construct with traditional construction materials and technologies. Can we really afford to add more of such unsafe buildings to our cities and villages? Science and technology have to step in. Scientifically proven technologies need to penetrate into the Indian construction practices in a most acceptable and user-friendly manner. The scientists and researchers at the Central Building Research Institute of the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research are studying simple technological options to make earthquake resistant buildings and that too without adding substantially to their cost. Welcome to CSIR Central Building Research Institute at Roorkee. As you know Central Building Research Institute is primarily engaged in the research and development activities on different aspects of building science and technology. Out of many areas, one of the focus areas of this institute is on the disaster mitigation and its engineering. As you know, over decades, uh, different kinds of natural calamities have struck over this earth in form of earthquake, landslide, floods, cyclones, and so on. There are different kinds of stipulations that are prescribed for making a structural system, whether it's building or any other form of structures, resistant against uh, such calamities. And it has been noted that during earthquakes, these masonry buildings do suffer a lot of damages. So one of our primary concerns were that how do we make these masonry structures resistant against earthquake? Our scientists have worked constantly on these aspects. In the recent past, they have developed a system which is uh, of course based on the confined masonry systems that are available worldwide and a full scale testing has been carried out for the first time in this country in our institute to demonstrate that, that a confined masonry building is very effective in resisting such earthquakes. Uh, it has been demonstrated through experimentations and also through analytical uh, calculations. Load-bearing masonry walls supporting a roof is the most common way how houses are being constructed in India from time immemorial to even this day. 
common masonry units like clear bricks, stones or concrete blocks joined together with mortar display good load bearing strength, heat insulation properties, durability and resistance to rains, winds, corrosion and decay. But what they cannot resist is tensile force or stress reversals. Our ancestors knew this by their own experience. They tried to improve their masonry works by reinforcing it with bamboo or wooden ties and bracings. Oversimplification, rising cost of timber and exposure to construction systems of the plains gradually eliminated the use of timber reinforcement from traditional masonry. Such unreinforced masonries proved fatal in the recent quakes of Latu, Bhuj, Chamoli, Doda and so on. The sad experience of these earthquakes motivated people to bind masonry walls with reinforced concrete bands at plinth, sill, lintel and roof levels. Vertical steel bars at corners and openings were used to bind walls with roof and foundation. Though effective, a better solution was still needed. During the last few decades, engineers tried to embrace masonry panels with reinforced cement concrete tie columns and bond beams. This masonry emerged as a better alternative for low to medium rise buildings. Here, masonry is done first, leaving gaps for RCC tie columns. The gaps are then filled with cement concrete. We thus get masonry walls confined within the frame of tie columns and bond beams. This is called confined masonry. Unlike RCC framed structures, where all the loads are carried by RCC columns and beams, in confined masonry, the masonry wall panels take and transfer all the loads to foundation. When the ground shakes, the bond beams and tie columns effectively hold the masonry in its original shape. The continuous tie columns and bond beams along all the dimensions of a structure improve its wall-to-wall, wall-to-roof and roof-to-wall connections. The whole structure acts like an integrated unit by adequate confinement. But how much is adequate? This is the question that the researchers and engineers of the CSIR Central Building Research Institute wanted to explore. Advanced modeling techniques were applied to study improvement of confined masonry over traditional masonries. The theoretical results were encouraging. The researchers now wanted to experimentally verify and validate the net effect of confining members in terms of increase in strength and deformation capacity over reinforced and unreinforced masonry. Excellent research facilities available at the Building Dynamics Laboratory of the Institute came handy. A full-scale model of confined masonry, 3 meter long, 3 meter wide, and 3 meter high was constructed using 220 mm thick brick masonry walls. One part of cement and six parts of sand was used to prepare the mortar for laying the bricks. First of all, reinforcement cages consisting of four numbers of 10 mm diameter TMT steel bars with 6 mm dia TMT steel stirrups were erected from the foundation beam. The stirrups were spaced 200 mm apart at the mid spans and 100 mm apart at the ends. Thereafter, masonry was raised in steps of not more than 1.2 meter in height at a time. To make a good bond with RCC tie columns, 40 mm boothing was provided in the masonry at the tie column interface. Shuttering was provided on two faces 
and for the other two faces, the toothed masonry edges were utilized. M20 grade cement concrete was poured gradually and compacted well using a pin vibrator. The toothed ends became a part of the tie column and formed a monolithic assembly. Alternatively, about 450 mm long pieces of 8 mm dia steel bars can be placed in masonry after every fourth course. The protruding steel bars become a part of the tie columns and provide a good bond between masonry and concrete. On reaching the door window lintel level, shuttering was provided over the masonry to cast the lintel band or the bond beam. The reinforcement in the bond beams was the same as that in the tie columns. But the main steel bars extended through the tie columns into the bond beam on the other side. The concrete was laid and compacted well to bind the four walls and tie columns together. The steel bars of the tie columns continue through the bond beam and are anchored into the roof slab, thus binding the structure horizontally as well as vertically. After about a month, the experimental model gained sufficient strength. It was then subjected to dynamic loading. During an earthquake, inertial forces are generated at roof level. To simulate uniform distribution of these forces, a steel girlage mechanism was developed. The mechanism clamped the two opposite sides of the test model to apply cyclic lateral loads. Cyclic lateral loads were applied using a 50 ton capacity programmable servo controlled hydraulic actuator having 150 mm stroke length. The actuator applied lateral cyclic displacement loading on the test structure at roof level. The incremental displacement controlled lateral loading was applied at a slow rate of 0.004 Hz to eliminate material strain rate effects. Three cycles for each displacement were applied up to ultimate failure. Strain gauges and linearly variable differential transformers commonly called as LVDTs were deployed at critical locations to measure deformation of the building. Enthusiastic postgraduate students and PhD scholars worked hard to help the scientists. They were communicating with the scientists at the main instrumentation facility and ensuring best possible accuracy in the results of load, displacement, crack pattern and so on. A comparative study of seismic performance of different types of masonry buildings revealed interesting results. Confined masonry proved superior to reinforced and unreinforced masonries. Confined masonry was about three times better than unreinforced masonry and two times better than reinforced masonry. It also improved inductivity of the structure by about 35 percent. Through our research, we found that confined masonry as a whole, including masonry walls, column, beam, and slabs, act as an integral unit. It exhibits excellent performance in seismic event. In addition, it is economically viable and makes use of locally available construction materials and skills. Simplicity of construction, use of locally available materials, and cost economics are the reasons why confined masonry system is gaining popularity. Many low and medium rise buildings are being constructed using confined masonry even in a very small town of Rurke. So here, uh, here is Mr. Singhal, uh, owner of the house, constructing his house using 
confined missionary techniques. So, Mr. Singhal, what prompted you to adopt this particular technology during the construction? Uh, sir, when we are planning for this house, we read an article in Amar Ujala paper regarding this technology. So, we are very much inspired by this article and we decided to go for this technology because we want to make our house more and more safer for our family. Uh, Earthquake is one of the important uh, natural calamities that have happened which have caused disasters all over the places. So, confined masonry system is definitely useful, effective uh, against resisting such earthquake actions. So, we propose that the confined masonry system should be widely used for the primarily for the areas where uh, we know that earthquake is one of the important aspects which might occur in future. Never confuse confined masonry with RCC framed construction. In confined masonry, all loads are carried by masonry walls down to the foundation. The use of confined masonry is therefore limited to medium rise buildings. At higher levels, providing shuttering plates at two faces of walls is difficult. Two 16 mm dia steel bars are placed over previously cast column to support the shuttering plates. These bars are removed at the time of knocking the shuttering. The steel bars of tie columns remain exposed till the roof is laid. To check rusting of these bars, a coat of cement slurry may be given. Earthquakes may also trigger landslides. Valleys often get inundated by overflowing rivers. The rivers bring mud, boulders and trees during heavy rains. It is therefore important that houses are not constructed adjacent to unstable slopes or very close to rivers. It is generally preferable that buildings are square in plan and not more than two stories in height. Try to keep room sizes small. Do not allow unsupported walls to be more than four and a half meters in length. Provide adequate supports to walls by cross walls, buttresses, T junctions and corners. Even the best designed buildings may not provide desired safety if quality is not ensured. Good workmanship and adherence to correct construction practices do not cost much today, but cost dearly on the day when the earth shakes. For all disasters, there is an opportunity to build back better dwellings for the next generation so that when an earthquake strikes, it remains disaster but not a tragedy. This presentation is an effort of the CSIR Central Building Research Institute, Rurki, India to bring simple science and technological solutions at your doorstep.